Welcome to Living Destiny Church, where your destiny comes alive. You're about to listen to another life-changing message. Get ready for some divine revelation. Here's Pastor Moses. Well, since you have not seen me in two weeks, (laughs) hallelujah, I must preach three messages in one Sunday. Hallelujah. You're ready for this? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O God, that it is powerful, it is alive and active. Daddy, all of you and none of me in the name of Jesus. I declare the chain-breaking anointing, O God, flow in the name of Jesus. Daddy, we will not leave here the same. Let revival, O God, let breakthrough provoke us in the name of Jesus. I establish order in your life in the name of Jesus. Wherever there is disorder, I declare order in your life in the name of Jesus. Whatever is dragging you, mm, whatever is dragging you, I feel like the way somebody has a dog and the dog is running and you are trying to hold it, whatever is dragging you into chaos, I, I declare stop in the name of Jesus. I speak order into your life in the name of Jesus. I speak order into your mind. Right now, thoughts everywhere, mind everywhere. I uh, can't try, can't, can't, can't figure out what to do. I declare order, peace in the name of Jesus. You're a child of God. You are born to rule and to reign in this life. You are called to stand and manifest the kingdom of God. Chaos is not your portion. In the name of Jesus. Confusion is not your portion. In the name of Jesus. Be established right now. Sound mind. Order. Order. In the mighty name of Jesus. Daddy, we give you praise. Daddy, we give you praise. For that one who has taken time off from your consistency in his presence, get back. Get back. Get back in the name of Jesus. And for the one who has given up, hope renewed. Your God is faithful. Don't say, I keep trying, I keep trying, I keep trying. It's not working. I'm just going to get, no, no. Hold on to the unchanging heart of God. I declare order in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen. amen. Well, before I, we, we left on the, on, the, on the trip, we were dealing with the theme submission. Someone say submission. Submission in covenant. So this would be the last part of it. The third part, submission in covenant. We talked a lot about submission begins what? With their heart towards God first, right? Submission begins to with, 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 with who first? With who first? If you are not submitted to God, I guarantee you, you will not submit to anybody. If you are not submitted to God, nobody can tell you nothing. If, if you don't fear God and are not submitted to him, it's not going to work, amen. So submission begins first with God. And when you are serving somebody and you feel like they are not walking right or they are not doing what you believe they are supposed to do, your submission is to God and your service is to them. Somebody say amen. God may not have released you out of that service. And so you don't rebel in that situation. You keep serving in that situation. Understanding that your submission is not to man. Your submission is to God. Somebody say amen. I told you that at at one point in your life, you are under an authority that you don't like. At some point, whether, whether, whether federal government, local government, parents, uh, uh, friends, boss, business, there's, you are somewhere that you are like, mm, right? And that is part of God's program. Submission is God's program to train you for kingdom advancement. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Embrace it. You are not going to be king of your castle and king everywhere you go. Somebody say amen. You're going to serve somebody. And God will allow you to go through it so he can break you and form you. Somebody say amen. 
We talked about forced submission being unhealthy. The Bible said that do not be like the heathen who lord over them by you serve God's people. And so the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 9, there comes a time when one rules over another to his own hurt. You've held on so much, you won't let them go to the point where now it's not even controlled to your advantage. Now it's hurting you. Let them go. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, so Proverbs 4, 23. Let's begin there. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23. Proverbs 4, verse number 23. You know, submission is relational and it begins in the heart. Submission is really a matter of of the heart, not a matter of just the outward appearance, amen, because you can do it outwardly, but in your heart, if you don't mean it, it means nothing. Bible said, I watch over your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows what all the issues of life. Say, submission comes from the heart. Say boldly, submission comes from the heart. Because too often we are quick to please people with our actions, but our hearts are far away. You really don't care. You're just doing what you got to do just to get the work done. And are you happy? Okay, be gone. That is not genuine submission. Somebody say hallelujah. Submission must come from their heart. And that's where it becomes difficult because it is not about faking it or just throwing things out. It's about the heart. Somebody say amen. Today I'm going to go somewhere. Amen. Uh, on the on the mission trip, you know, we went to Apostle Salom and the church. And uh, I shared with you that when we go on missions, it is what they want us to do. If they want us to stand by the door and jump on one leg, we're going to stand at the door and jump on one leg and come to America, right? We're going to do all of that. But we are submitted unto them, right? And I, I want to use this as, a, as, as an example that as soon as I landed, I am senior pastor of Living Destiny Church. As soon as I landed, I willingly submitted to him. It is not, uh, I'm, I'm also senior pastor. So, hey, my friend, first of all, you don't know where you are going. <laughs> Second of all, you can't drive in this land. Third of all, you're a guest. Oh, I mean, Ghana is home to me. But he's the one hosting us. The ability of a leader to be a follower will be tested. Your ability to be a leader and still follow will be tested. Many of us think the moment you are anointed a leader in the, in the, in the Second Baptist Church, Episcopal of the International Ministries Organization, the moment you are ordained as bishop over there, now you are bishop everywhere. No, you are not. You will go somewhere and they'll put you in the back seat because nobody knows you. Maybe they heard about you. Maybe they just don't want to put you in the front. It is what it is. You're going to be in the back. But being able to follow whilst being a leader is critical. If you cannot submit as a follower because you must always lead, there's a hard issue. You are asking to be worshipped like God. Let me give you one, one definition of submission then. Submission will be deferring to another for the sake of kingdom advancement. Deferring to another for the sake of kingdom advancement. I play the drums. When I get on the drums, if I get on the drums and, and I have to play, it doesn't matter how much senior pastor I am. When the, when the worship leader says quiet down, bro man, you quiet down. Because at this point in time, you, listen church, balance it in your heart. Because I, I, I know many of us struggle with, 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 with who do you think I am? You are somebody someplace and you want that deference everywhere you go. Learn to be quiet and not seen. Bible says that when you go someplace, sit in the back and be invited to the front. Otherwise, you sit in the front and someone more important comes and there's a walk of shame. You have to walk back. Somebody say hallelujah. 
Learn to be submissive. Learn to not always be in charge. So we submitted. Let's go to Galatians 5. Today, today we, are, we, are, we, are, we are going somewhere. Galatians 5.13. It truly bothers some people when they go somewhere and people don't know who they are. Listen, you were, you were manager in your, in your, in your mother's, uh, what's the name? Hair braiding business. We, we still don't know you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's on your resume, you were manager. Congratulations. But we don't know you like that. Somebody say hallelujah. Learn to humble yourself. Because it's a matter of the heart, right? Learn to humble yourself and be one of great authority. But still be able to wash other people's feet. Be one of great authority. And you go somewhere and they, and they are moving tables and chairs. And nobody knows you. You just take your jacket off and move tables and chairs. You don't sit down and say, where's my umbrella? It's hot. Church folk, we are like that. When you go somewhere and you want people to recognize you, don't you see me? Don't you see I am important? Have you seen my car? No, we don't care about your car. We don't care who you are. We always have to find a way to, hey, Bishop, hey, Pastor, what's that? I know I'm going to tell a story without mentioning any. We were in a service. We were in a service. <laughs> we were in a service, and I had invited Bishop to come minister to us. Okay. So Bishop Macbeth is coming. Somebody knew that Bishop Macbeth is coming. And so guess what? They were, they, I don't know if they had a spy at the door or not. But the moment Bishop was about to hit the door, they were about to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I kid you not. And it, when you are going to the bathroom, oh, come on, come on. When you, are, when, you are, when you are going to the bathroom, it doesn't matter who is coming in. You just say hello and you keep on going. But this was not so. This was, hello, oh, how are you? Uh, and my name is this, and this is my ministry. Come, that is out of order, completely not following protocol. And at that point, I believe in my heart, he, she was dismissed by Bishop. If you do that to me, I will intentionally forget your name. Because you have to go back to the basics and learn what it means to walk in ministry protocol. A man of God about to minister to a place that is not your church. Calm down. You know, I know you, you want your business to grow and your ministry to be expanded. But the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Somebody say amen. So even as a leader, learn to be submissive and learn to calm down. Somebody say amen. Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, what? Serve one another. Somebody say amen. Through liberty was serve one another. And so servant leadership is not forced leadership. It is earned submission. Someone say earned submission. You have to earn the submission of people. So don't legislate it. Don't preach it. Don't force it. You must earn it by being an example and being consistent. I am going to serve you until you decide I am worthy of being submitted to. Somebody say amen. All right, so that was, all, that was all introduction. I'm about to preach now. The theme, the theme for the fast is this yoke must break. This yoke must break. And we are going to delve deep into it 
spiritual bones. It feels like you are, you are, you are close, but there's, there's something. There's a, there's a yoke that must break to unleash the greatness of God in your life. Somebody say amen. And so we're going to pray that. Today in this sermon, I'm going to apply that. The yoke must break. Some of us have put a yoke around people's necks. Because you were nice to them one time. Because, because at some point in time, they needed you. So now you have put a yoke and a chain and a demand on them. And they cannot be free. break that yoke in the name of Jesus. Submission must be willing. You cannot force submission. It's got to be earned. If I'm going to walk in partnership with you, it must come from the heart. It must be something that I choose to do to serve you. But when you put a yoke on people, a demand, every time something happens, are you forgetting the last time I did this for you? Are you forgetting the last time I did this for you? That is, that is manipulation. That is witchcraft. That is control. That is so demonic. It is not of God. The moment you take away somebody's will, they, they cease to exist as a human being. So as I'm preaching right now, just scan your relationships. If you're putting a yoke on somebody, I called you. Why didn't you pick up right away? Hey, my friend. I called yesterday. How come you haven't responded? My friend. When I said come, take the yoke off. Take that demand off. You are not their God. You are not their God and they are not supposed to be bowing down to you and worshiping you. Break the yoke off their neck. Because one time you prayed for me and God moved and so what? Come, listen, relax. God just used you in that moment. But that burden we place on people must be broken in the name of Jesus. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 25. I want to give you an example here. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say unto you, in as much as what you have done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. <clears throat> what is Jesus saying over there? He says, whatever I do for miles, I did not do for miles, I did it for him. Right? Saul, so, Saul, so, why are you persecuting me? He says, ah, how am I persecuting you? He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Saul was persecuting Christians. Jesus took it personal that if you persecute Christians, you are persecuting me. Right? In the same way, whatever you do to anyone, you have done it unto me. And so now, if your service is to the Lord, why are you looking at miles to pay you back? If you are doing it for God, and you are serving God, why am I putting a yoke around his neck, expecting him to jump at my very core and respond to me when whatever I have done for him, I did it as unto the Lord. So, Bible says, you know, if I give him a cup of water, I want to use that illustration. Miles, I'll give you a cup of water. Yeah, a cup of water. If I give him a cup of water, I have given it unto the Lord. Cool down with, with the overestimation of what you just did. Because sometimes we give people a cup of water and we are like, oh my God, they were about to die. They were just choking and I brought water and just saved their lives and saved their entire generation. It didn't hurt you just gave them a cup of water. Somebody say hallelujah. It is with that understanding that we demand now, now that I have saved your life and your entire family, now I own you. Don't get it twisted. You probably give him a cup of water to drink. 
whilst he was sitting by a river. He just didn't have a cup. So you just brought the cup. So don't be so excited and place a demand on him because you gave water to somebody who is sitting by water. We overestimate what we do. I, I'm going to use this, this example again. Eh? You know what? You pray for somebody and, and, and they have a testimony and they don't mention your name. I prayed for you and God answered. When you were testifying, you couldn't even mention. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even ask for my last name, just my first name. <laughs> but for all you know, prayers have been going on for 15 years. Your prayer was just the last envelope we used to seal the whole thing. And now you want to take credit for everything. They were praying before they met you. Years ago, people were praying. You just said in Jesus' name, amen. And now you want credit for everything. Calm down. Take the yoke of people's necks. Somebody say amen. So mouse may be sitting by a whole river and just needed a cup. And that's all I did. So don't overestimate your input, right? Or mouse was there and I brought him the cup of water. And the cup of water had nothing to do with him. He probably didn't drink the water. God was just seeing. It was your step to your next level. He had nothing to do with him. God was like, oh, I need him to give water to somebody. Oh, Miles is there. Give him water. So stop putting a yoke on Miles' neck when this was all part of your test for the next level. He probably just took the water and said, why is this guy giving me water? I don't need it. You are going away thinking, I saved my house life. And God is like, no. He didn't need the water. It was just part of your processing. So take the yoke off his neck. Stop mentioning that every time on the own. I remember there was a guy named Miles. He was about to die. Listen, my friend, no, he wasn't about to die. It was just your step to the next level. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Or maybe Miles really needed the water. And God was saying, give him the water and let me test your heart to see if you are looking to me or looking to mouse. Somebody say hallelujah. That's where submission is. Humble. And don't put a yoke on people's necks demanding that they serve you because you did one thing for them. Because, because you, you, you stood by me through a difficult time. Or because you gave me a phone call. Or because you gave me a job reference and, and the door opened. Now, every paycheck I must tie to you. Or at Christmas, you're expecting something significant. Because if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be in this job. Now, Bible said, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. At that point, you have received your blessing. Nothing more shall come of it. Somebody say amen. Somebody's like, you're going to wait all year. Nothing's coming to you. Somebody say hallelujah. So stop yoking people because you once helped them. Can I go deeper here? I want to talk to parents because we are, we are about to get to marriage soon. So that I have to do with parenting. Parents, stop putting a yoke around your children's neck. Stop it. Show them, model them, model for them what submission and love really is and earn their submission. Using the phrase, because I birthed you. Africa, we say, because I born you. Because I birthed you does not qualify you for submission. It qualifies you for respect, not submission. Submission is one choosing to lay down. So if I don't choose to and you are forcing me now, it is no longer submission. Parents, children, respect your parents. Honor your parents. That is biblical. 
That is the word of the Lord. But that, that phrase, I birthed you, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. Try it. You're going to jail. <laughs> Try and take me out. You're going to go to jail. There's no way you can reverse the issue. So try to take me out, and you will be in jail. I'll be with Jesus, and you're going to be in jail. <laughs> Stop, man. Let's stop manipulating the pressure of, you know what, if you don't do this, I control you. You don't control their life. You know the other phrase that's very dangerous is that um, they, are, they, are, they are choosing to submit now only because they are dependent on you. If you don't model it and you force it, they will do it because if I don't do it, I can't eat. I ain't got no place to stay. Bro, man, you got to do what you got to do. And so they will do what they got to do until they don't have to do what they have to do. That is where you will realize that their submission was just buying time. Be careful. Forcing it. Model it. Show them. This is what it means to love. This is what it means to forgive. Now, son, I have to correct you. I have to check you. Now, come. Let's talk about it. My daughter, you can go there. Bible says this. And when they see your life doing exactly what you are preaching, they're like, wow, my mother, my father. Wow, I want to be like them. I want to be like Jesus. And then they will grow, train up a child in a way that they should go. Forcing submission. They will change their mind quickly. And unfortunately, many of you have even experienced it in your own life. The moment you broke out of your parents' control, you felt like you had to make up for all the years of imprisonment. It's my time. Freedom, freedom. Now you cut loose. <laughs> you were out there trying to pay back every year they kept things from you. So now, parents, the very, the very goal you wanted is now violated. You wanted them to do it your way. You press them. Now they are gone. Now they are doing opposite of now they are becoming a prayer topic. Because you did not model submission and you try to force it. That is not God. Somebody say amen. Uh, oh, God. Mm, okay. Your kids are not part of your retirement plan. Take that yoke off their neck. Your children are not your retirement plan. It's like the way, oh, how tall are you? Six feet. Oh, MBA. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> your children are not your retirement plan. Your retirement plan is entirely your responsibility. It is wonderful, though, in your old age where they come. And they come to visit you with their family. And they come bearing gifts. And say, mom and dad, I want to bless you with this. Thank you. Once in a while, they'll call and say, I sent you something. Because I value the investment and what you poured in me. But stop budgeting on something that is not guaranteed to you. It is nice if they do it. I highly recommend that children, you do that. I believe you should. It is mightily wonderful. But parents, stop banking on it. So now you are putting a yoke on their neck. The person says, I want to be a musician. He says, no, you will be a lawyer. <laughs> Listen, my life depends on your life. You will be what I say <laughs> you will be. So now they are doing something because you are afraid that if they are single, anybody going to pay them and you both going to be broke. Somebody say hallelujah. Take the yoke off their neck. Do your own savings. Do your own working. And truly, from the bottom of my heart, when, when my parents were alive, we sent them money consistently. I totally believe in that. But again, it must come from their heart. If your child is sending you money by force and by pressure, do you even want that money? Someone says, I'll take it. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care if it's by far. Cash is cash. You know what I'm saying? Green is green. I, I hear you. 
by the heart. So please, come up with your own retirement plan, get your life insurance, get your investment, save your money wisely, and take the yoke of your children. Somebody say amen. Let's look at John 21 verse 18. John chapter 21 verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will gird you, will clothe you, and bring you where you do not wish to go. This is a very humbling verse. Saying that when you are young, you just get up, you grab your stuff, jacket on, as you go through the door, you are in the car, poof, you're gone. But a time will come when you are older, you say, come on, come on, come on, come on, dad. Stretch your hands. Okay, good. Okay, now I'm going to go to your back. Now stretch your hands. Oh, it hurts. Okay, okay. Be careful how you press and put the yoke over your children's neck now. They may have to spend the rest of their life taking that yoke off. And when you need them to be there for you, they are busily trying to figure out what's my name, who I am, what has God called me to do. Because you put that yoke upon them. When they are, they should be joyfully coming and saying, you know what, I'm moving towards you. I'm coming towards you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do this. Willingly, joyfully doing it. But when you force submission, they will go, f- they will look at the map. Where are you? Where's the father's point? There. I don't even like it, but here I'm going. Because they don't want to run into you at the store. They don't want, they don't want the phone. The number you are calling is out of coverage area. They want you to think of a time zone. What time is it there? Is it 8 o'clock? Is it 4 o'clock? Mama was asleep. That's what's going to happen. Think of the future, parents. Think of the future. I had, I had a very humbling discussion with my daughter. I was like, MFA, I am telling you to do this. I know I'm tough. I'm tough on my children. I'm very, I'm very strong. I'm loving them, hugging them, all of that. But I'm very clear. They are... They are, they are ladies, and they are women, and this generation, this world is mean to women especially. So I have to train them to be tough, to be resolute, to be convinced, not moved by what other people say. So I, I, I push that. But in our, in our conversation, I said, Emma, there will come a time. Daddy cannot tell you what to do. I can only ask you to do. So don't feel, I'm, I'm, I'm training you and I'm guiding you. Right now, you are my responsibility. So I got to check you. I got to go through everything and prepare you. But there comes a time you cannot require it. Come here today. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. They saw it. They will tell you. They didn't see the message. No, because, because if, I, if, if I responded, it would be a whole different issue. So guess what? I didn't see it. You cannot be pressing and demanding on them. Using, using all sorts of manipulations and... No, don't do that. Because the time will come. We will need our children. See what I'm saying? A time will come. We will need our children. And so I'm going to take care of you. And, and God willing, you are blessed and you are favored. <clears throat> And you are willing to return it. And, 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 and do you know how wonderful it is when you are blessed and taking care of other people's children? In your old age, people will come around you. In your old age, people will come around you. All of a sudden, every need you have is there. A nurse that lives next door says, you know what? I'm going to check on you every day. You got this. They are because you have invested and not forced. Somebody say hallelujah. All right, so one more, a few more scriptures, and then we'll go. The progression of the parent-child relationship. Real quickly, I'm going to summarize it. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. We're talking about submission, not being forced, and taking the yoke off of people. Earn it, model it, love them, show them the right way to go, and it will come back to you, right? Good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. Don't be deceived, a man reap whatever he sows, right? So it's, it's a principle. If you sow kindness, you will get kinder. If you sow love, you get... If you sow manipulation and control. 
Do we even think about that? We only think only the good things we sow come back. But the evil things you sow also have a way of multiplying and then... Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And so Saul came to Jerusalem, and he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was what? A disciple. Verse 27, but Barnabas, what? Took him in. Someone say Barnabas. <clears throat> Barnabas takes Saul in at a time where everybody was afraid of him. He basically introduced him to the council of the apostles. Come on in. They are afraid of you, but on my account, come on in. Right? So at that point, Saul was nobody. He was anointed, preaching the gospel, doing, but nobody in the kingdom respected him. Who, who brought him in? Barnabas. Someone say Barnabas. It means son of encouragement. Barnabas. Let's go to Acts 11, 21. Acts 11, verse number 21. I'm going to try to go through it fast. And the land of the Lord was moving. Men for believe. Verse 22. Then the news came to the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to the church in Antioch. Jump all the way to the last verse, verse number 26. So guess what? News breaks out in Antioch that souls are getting saved. People are getting transformed. And so the church from Jerusalem sends Barnabas, the son of encouragement, to go to Antioch and go help them. Like, wow, this is mighty. Barnabas leaves Antioch and goes to Tarsus to find who? Saul. Says, after I introduced you in Jerusalem to the apostles, I realized there was something unique about you. You had to run away because they were about to kill you. He ran to Tarsus. I have come to Antioch. I need help. Who can I think of? Saul. Let me go get Saul and bring Saul to Antioch. And they stayed there a whole year teaching. So from the beginning, it was, you need me, Saul. Without Barnabas, Saul will be hated. So Saul needs Barnabas. The next level, Barnabas needs, last scripture, Acts 13, verse 2. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. And they ministered, and the church, and the Lord and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit came and said what? Separate unto me. Barnabas and what? For the work which I have called them. Let's, if you can follow my, my parallel, okay? Parenting. Your child is Saul. You are Barnabas. They need you. They cannot break into life, into opportunities without you. They need you. After a while in time, you are going to work with them in life. Can you pick up your little brother? Can you call this? Can you go? I need you to help me with this. And together you are doing life and ministry together. A time will come. It will not be Saul who Barnabas introduced. It will be Saul and Barnabas. They are now considered equal. And if we even go to a more dangerous level, Saul did more work than Barnabas. Parents, your children need you. You will work with your children. They will become adults as your equals. And your desire should be that they will even do more than you did. That must be your heart desire. So we break, we break out of this suppressing, controlling, I like green, you will wear green, I like yellow. You, all these personal manipulations suffocate the gifting of God in their life. That they are unwilling to come back with joy to celebrate you. Someone say earn submission. Extend this to every area of your life, on your job, with your friends. Don't press people into submission. Show them. Love them. And when they choose to serve you, and when they choose to walk with you, it will be from your heart that even when people lie about you, they'll be like, nah, I know him. Nah, I know her. Because of the value they have put in my life. Somebody say amen. Please stand up on your feet.